Hi, it's great to have you with us today. We are so happy you could be with us. I would like to mention that Elder Jim will have the Lord's Supper meditation. And of course, as always, we invite you to participate with us using the emblems of your choice. And with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we just want to thank you again for this wonderful time together uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ on the foundation of your son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth to save us. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for this great love that you have for the world, uh, this great love that you have for us through Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the hope that we have and the future we have in him. And so we just pray a blessing on this time, dear Lord, as we pray, as we partake of, of the supper that Jesus established. Uh, as we just lift our hearts and minds to you, as we learn and sit at your feet, uh, in all things uh, that you receive glory. And we just praise this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Uh, before we uh, partake of the emblems this morning, I just wanted to talk a little bit this morning on timing. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. I said I wanted to talk about the timing of this a little bit. We take time every Sunday to recognize Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. And Sometimes we're under the illusion that there's always more time. 
And uh, that is a true and false statement. As long as we draw breath, there's still time to recognize Jesus for who he is and receive the salvation that he offers. But once we draw our last breath, there's no more time. This is demonstrated when Jesus was hanging on the cross. One of the criminals that was hanging with him was throwing insults at him and said, that, Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him and said, Don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I will tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. All that criminal had to do was recognize who Jesus was and understand who he was, what he was doing. And Jesus told him, you will be with me in paradise today, immediately. Before we take these emblems, let's take a moment and uh, just think about what our shortcomings are, how we've fallen short of the glory of God, how there's nothing we can do to deserve this gift He's given us, and ask for His forgiveness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for the gift of Your Son. Lord, I thank You for uh, putting Your will before what we our requests. So often You move before we ask that we sometimes don't see it until we look back. But Lord, we take this moment to look back to the cross that You willingly went to just to save our souls. Lord, we thank You and we praise You. In Your Son's name. Before we uh, go into the message today, let's, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for your word. Uh, it is truth. It is light. It gives us direction. It gives us hope, dear Lord. Inspired by our Holy Spirit, we pray that as we receive your word, your Holy Spirit will lead, guide, direct us, convict us, dear Lord, in those areas we need to be convicted. May we uh, gain uh, more trust, have a better understanding of the great love that you have for us and, and, and just more confidence, dear Lord, as we approach life and as we walk as Jesus walked on this earth, only to live and reign with him one day in heaven. So we want to thank you as we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are concluding our series, uh, Rethinking. We have given attention to our rethinking on uh, our perspective as Christians, our mission as individuals and as the church, our identity, not as decided by the world, but as decided by Christ, our involvement and our opportunities to serve. And, and finally today, uh, I would like to take a look at Rethinking Our Lives. Just generally speaking, rethinking our lives as Christians, dwelling on our lives. Uh, first, I would like to take a look at an early uh, Christian theologian who was converted in his middle uh, in middle age and was ordained a presbyter, otherwise known as an elder. Uh, this was in Carthage in North Africa, and his name was Tertullian. His name was Tertullian. Uh, he is quoted often uh, in this phrase, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And today it feels appropriate, especially uh, this is, I guess we could say Valentine's Day weekend and tomorrow Monday is Valentine's Day. Uh, it feels right, it feels appropriate uh, to use another quote from Tertullian uh, because of the um, 
the, and, and the moral excellence of the Christian life taught and lived out in Scripture, uh, when it's obeyed, there is a moral excellence that to be a Christian, to be a part of the church, again, from Scripture, uh, when, when it's lived out and obeyed. So I would like to just share with you what Tertullian, and again, this are, these are generations after the, after the disciples, Jesus' followers. Uh, these are multiple generations. This is after the first century going into the second century. Uh, we see uh, Tertullian, uh, as he envisioned unbelievers, the world, looking and watching Christians, watching how they treat one another, how they live, looking at them and saying, Look how they love one another. How they are ready to die for each other. Wow. Speaking of Christians, as the world, uh, uh, pagans, unbelievers are watching the, in, in the first, second century, look how they, believers, disciples, Christians, love one another in the body of Christ how they are ready to die for each other. Now again, this is written, uh, let's say, uh, the statement is about 150 years or so after one of Jesus' primary commands to his followers. Uh, now, generations later, in the church, uh, this appears to be still being lived out and carried out, this divine command. And as we have identified the the uh, mission of the church uh, is, of course, to make disciples. But what I would like to do for us today, especially for Victory, is to look to Victory's vision statement. Uh, and the vision statement um, is taking the mission statement of the church, but looking at our unique personalities, our qualities, our giftedness at Victory, and, uh, and then fulfilling the mission of the church, kind of putting it in a way that really fits uh, our the way we are, the way we live, and the particular, again, gifts we have, how we get things done. And this is what our vision statement is. The mission of uh, our, the church, our church, every individual, every individual Christian, and the church itself is to make disciples. But our vision statement, how we kind of get it done, our mission statement is sharing the good news, the gospel, our lives, and our lives to come. The mission of the church is to make disciples. We're called individually to do this. As the church corporately, this is what we are called to do. Our vision statement, how we kind of get it done with our per particular personalities and abilities, giftedness, the uh, way we do it, sharing the good news, the gospel, our lives and our lives to come. Now, during Jesus' ministry, earthly ministry, when he was having his final meal in the evening, with his disciples. Uh, this is before his arrest and, and shortly after that his crucifixion. Uh, Jesus gave what is called uh, the farewell address to his disciples the night he was betrayed. And you know, usually uh, the important things when we are leaving each other, if there's something important, usually it's sort of the last things that are being said. Uh, so one of the last things that Jesus said the night he was betrayed uh, had great importance. Uh, Jesus speaking to his disciples, Jesus said, and this is with endearment, little children, uh, yet a little while, while I'm with you, you will seek me, and just as I said to the Jew, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. You're to love one another as fellow disciples, as fellow believers. Now, what makes this command of love new? Because the command to love God, uh, the command to love uh, the brothers and sisters, fellow believers, uh, the, the command to love your neighbor is all in the Old Testament. It isn't really new. But here's the challenge, because now this command to love has a higher standard. As Jesus is shortly facing the, the cruel, unspeakable, taunting and pain 
separation from the Father as a sin bearer on the cross, the ultimate excruciating death on the cross. Now, you know, that takes some love. Love with a cap, all caps. So this new command to love one another, just as I, Jesus, have loved you, raises the bar. Far beyond any earthly, worldly expression of love that can be possible. And as scripture tells us, we love, we know how to love. Because he loved us first. The supreme standard for love was set before you and me by Jesus. Set before his disciples. So it's then and, and now. A new command for a new age. The church age. The church, the bride of Christ. A new command I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another or love for one another. Now a lot of times we have different uh, marks or markers uh, for our Christian progress, our walk. We have different uh, mile markers, so to speak, in our walk, and we kind of use those to, hey, I'm progressing, I'm doing well, really well, but I'm going to tell you something. Um, what we're reading here, uh, this is the witness. This, how we love one another as believers, is a witness to the presence and the power of the kingdom of God. As we are standing in the midst of the world. The church is standing in the midst of the world. This is our witness. Because all people, all people, your family, your friends, neighbors, classmates, co-workers, your community, the world, all people will not think because what we think can be divorced from reality. They will know. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. All people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. To the very caliber and expression and depth that the Son of God has given us. That type of love. That raises the bar. That makes it a new command. In Francis Schaeffer's book, The Mark of the Christian, he cataloged two practical ways for believers to exhibit love for each other. Uh, the first one is this. Apologize and seek forgiveness. As, as a Christian to another Christian, to apologize and seek forgiveness. Because reconciliation to other believers is a prerequisite to worshiping God. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 5, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Makes sense. Now, the second practical way to exhibit love is to grant forgiveness. On the flip side, if we have been offended or feel offended, to grant forgiveness. As we think about forgiveness, as we remember, as we are bringing to the forefront the reality of this external forgiveness that we have received by the way of the cross, as we love one another, as Jesus Christ has loved us and has forgiven us. Again, in uh, his book, Francis Schaeffer's book, The Mark of a Christian, he wrote this. The church is to be a loving church in a dying culture. In the midst of the world, in the midst of our present dying culture, 
Jesus is giving a right to the world. Upon his authority, he gives the world the right to judge whether you and I are born-again Christians on the basis of our observable love toward all Christians. He continues. And I agree, that's pretty frightening. Jesus turns to the world and says, I've got something to say to you. On the basis of my authority, I give you a right. You may judge whether or not an individual is a Christian on the basis of how the love he shows to all Christians. In other words, if people come up to us and cast into our teeth the judgment that we are not Christians because we have not shown love toward other Christians, we must understand that they are only exercising a prerogative which Jesus gave them. That's a twist, but true. Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, and he, Jesus, came and preached peace to you who were far off, far away, and that's of Gentiles, and peace to those who were near, the Jewish patient. For through him, Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, the holy ones, and the members, here it is, of the household of God. The household of God. The family of God. Which is the church. How should we act and live with one another? How should we treat one another? Being in the same household of God. Paul also wrote to, to Timothy, uh, his son in the faith. He wrote, I hope to come to you soon. But I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. The local church is the family of God. Now, of course, on a larger scale, absolutely. But in every local church, local body. We are the family, the household of God. In fact, even in chapter 5 of 1 Timothy, Paul encourages Timothy to treat the members of his local church as he would treat members of his own family. If Tertullian lived today, in Stark County in Northwest Indiana, would it cross his mind that because of our embrace of Jesus' command to, to love one another as Jesus has loved us? Because all people, the world, will know we are Jesus' disciples if we love one another. If Tertullian lived today and knew us, could Tertullian envision unbelievers speaking about us? Look how they love one another. Look how they are ready to die for each other. Our love for other believers assures us and the world that our faith is genuine. Approximately 60 years after John and the other disciples heard this new command, the night Jesus was betrayed, this command to love one another as Christ loved them. Approximately 60 years later, this command must have echoed in John's heart and mind 
what he wrote. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning. That we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers and sisters. Whoever does not love abides in death. And all God's children must say, Amen.